Thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. It's great to be here. Uh, it will help you to have an actual Bible as well as the bit that was printed, because I'm going to use a few verses either side as well. So if you find John's Gospel, chapter 11, that will be a help to you. Um, I've never spoken at a men's convention before. I've just spoken to men, but usually men with a mixture of women as well. And I was trying to think, what makes a men's convention distinctive, and what should I say differently compared with just a normal Sunday sermon? I was trying to brainstorm this, and uh, one of the things was uh, cooked breakfasts. So I was staying with Phil last night, and he actually is a fantastic host. He even sent me a questionnaire of what would be my ideal stay the night before men's convention. And I said, what kind of breakfast would you like? Cooked breakfast. Maybe you had the same. Um, is that a distinctively male thing? I thought so. And then um, Phil told me that in the Bristol, uh, the Southwest Women's Convention, they also have a cooked breakfast. I was quite surprised at this. And then he said, no, they have a cooked breakfast for the men who help with the stewarding at the convention. I think that <laughs> the women have fruits and uh, yogurts and things like that. So maybe it's a cooked breakfast thing. Maybe it should be lots of references to football and rugby. Um, I'm afraid I'm totally out of my depth there. I don't really know about either. Um, Maybe there should be references to DIY aplenty. Again, not very competent at DIY. I got for my um, 40th birthday, as a present from a friend, a, a cordless drill, which I think was quite a pointed gift because previously, whenever I had DIY needs, I would ask this friend to help me with his drill, and then he gave me a drill. I'm not really into that. Maybe it's about banter. Um, maybe, it's about, um, maybe it's about the singing, that the singing is just a bit more bassy and male. And I even noticed that they very strategically chose the old original words. Did you notice that for that first hymn we were singing? Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Um, all you who hear, and I was sort of going to autopilot and singing brothers and sisters draw near. Oh, there's no sisters here. And I thought, no, they're, they're a step ahead of me. They've got the old words. Um, all to his temple draw near. Maybe it's those things for you. The, the trouble is about these things that are supposed to be male, um, is aren't they just cultural things? Because there are women who like bacon and eggs for breakfast, and there are women who are very good at DIY, and there are women who are into football and rugby, in fact, did rather better than the men <laughs> recently in the football. Uh, so which of these things are just sort of culturally blokey, and which of them are actually biblically male? Um, the, the Bible itself doesn't say loads about what's different about men and women, but there are a couple of things that come through clearly. Uh, one of the things in the Bible that is distinctively male is courage. To be willing to fight, to defend, to protect, to step up, to be courageous. And I've got a little bit of a ringing on my microphone. Can we, I don't know if we can turn that down a bit. I can speak louder if that would help. Um, this is in the wrong place. There we are. Thank you. Thank you, sound people. Um, courage is a distinctively male thing. So even non-Christians know this, the Philistines, when they're about to go to battle against Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 4, they give a rallying cry to their own pagan side of battle and say, take courage and be men, O Philistines. Well, you know, they're not being told to be more male than they are. You know, they're already men. But be men means be courageous, step up and fight lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they've been to you. Be men and fight. Uh, the Philistines know that and uh, the Christians know that. So Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, writes to the church, says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men and be strong. He's actually talking to the men and women in Corinth, but says, have that male characteristic about you of courage. It doesn't mean that women can't be courageous, but it's a particularly associated with being male thing to be courageous. Courage is a male characteristic. And another, I guess, that's very clear in the New Testament is sacrificial leadership. So in that very famous and important passage addressed to husbands and wives at the end of Ephesians chapter 5, uh, women are told to, wives are told to submit to their husbands and entrust themselves to their husband's leadership. Husbands are told, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, you're to lead, 
Uh, our wives are, are, are called to submit to their husbands, but the husbands, for their part, are called to love their wives in a sacrificial way. Uh, not a domineering way, but a laying down their life for them way, like Jesus loved the church. So I'm going to take those two characteristics of courage and sacrificial leadership as the particularly men's thing about a men's convention. Yes, we'll sing in a bassy way, and there's an unusual demographic around us. But let's think particularly of that application. As we look at John chapter 11 and 12, and I think we see those two characteristics in the man, Jesus Christ, in spades. Uh, real courage and real sacrificial leadership. Now, it might be you know these chapters well, um, and, but you may not have put them together before. So we're, we're looking at quite a big section, almost two chapters worth. I think in my head, I tend to divide the Gospels into little separate episodes, and I trust too much the little headings in my Bible. And it looks like there's a chapter about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And then there's a separate chapter of, or a separate section about people trying to kill Jesus. And then another section about Jesus being anointed at Bethany. And I, I want to put it back together. Because if you were reading John's Gospel, you know, reading it through um, as, a, as a story, as a narrative, they come quickly on the heels of each other. And in fact, in time, they come very quickly. Straight after Lazarus is raised from the dead, people plot to kill Jesus. And a woman um, at a dinner party pours a half a litre of perfume on his feet to embalm him for his burial. And I want to suggest, and we'll see in various ways today, that life for Lazarus means death for Jesus. Uh, in order to raise Lazarus from the dead, one of the most wonderful of all of Jesus' signs in this gospel, it comes at the cost of Jesus' death. And so therefore, the wonderful things that Jesus does for us are courageous and sacrificial. So uh, we're going to look at the two in, in turn, and we'll pick up the story in the beginning of chapter 11. So if you've got a Bible with you, I love this chapter. Um, it's a very strange chapter, though. 11 verse 1, a man named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay ill, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. That's already quite strange because we don't know about that yet. Like John hasn't yet told us about the woman who poured perfume on Jesus because it was that one. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. I suppose one of them is this story is so famous that people already know about it even before they start reading John's gospel. I mean, Jesus actually says um, in, in the other gospels, you know, everywhere in the world that this story is told, people will remember her. And that, that's true. Most, most Christians and some non-Christians know about the woman who poured perfume, um, you know, half a year's wages worth, like ultra, ultra expensive perfume, the kind you get at the airport. You know, if you get the... I don't know if you ever try fragrances. I always, when I'm going through Heathrow treat myself to an aftershave that is much more expensive than I can ordinarily justify buying, you know, the 100 quid a bottle one. The most expensive one that I found, just in case you're ever in the market for it, is the Penhaligon's one. It's just eye-wateringly expensive, like 250 pounds for 50 mils of perfume. So I, I spray that liberally on myself, and I smell, I smell fantastic for the duration of, a, of my flight. But um, this perfume is very, very expensive, and it's not just 50 mils, it's half a litre, and I, uh, by calculations, it would be the Penhaligon's one. The Penhaligon's Lloyd George, I think it's called. Uh, we all know about that, and even before we read John's Gospel, we know about that. So that, that's one reason. But I think the other reason is John already wants to tie together in our minds what happens in chapter 11 and what happens in chapter 12. It's a kind of flash-forward a little hint of what is about to happen later. Th this Mary, she's the one who got Jesus ready to be buried. I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, so G it's ominous. We've got Jesus' death in the background, even as Jesus hears about the sickness of Lazarus. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Jesus, the one that you love, is ill. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, this illness will not lead in death, will not end in death, 
No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus, is it, will it help if I move to the middle? Or should I change microphones? Are I further away from the speaker? No, that's worse. It's like a <laughs> Excuse me, I will soon try and ignore this so that you're not distracted, but I'm... Do you want to give me a different microphone? I could use a handheld one or something. Um, so, verse 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Here, I think, is one of the strangest two things in John chapter 11, this, this next word. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. An unusual connection, isn't it? I would expect maybe but, and quite an inexplicable but. Jesus loved them, but he didn't go to help. But John makes it even more weird. Jesus loved them, so he didn't go to help. What kind of love would that mean? If, you, I mean, if you're a doctor, I know there's at least one GP here in, in the convention. You know, your convention and your favorite patient is critically ill. And because you like that patient so much, you do nothing. Kind of odd, isn't it, as you, as you first read it? What, what can this mean? Although we kind of get a hint of it because... Jesus has already told us this sickness won't end in death. So uh, maybe because Jesus loved them so much, he wants Lazarus to die so that he can raise him. Keep reading. He then said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and you want to go back? You know, Bethany is just outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the religious HQ is. Jerusalem is where the Pharisees have their headquarters. They hate Jesus. They want to kill him. Do you seriously want to go back to Judea, Jesus? That is very dangerous to go so close. Rabbi, they said, um, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It's when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. I love this as well, this metaphor in the Bible that you call death being asleep. Why do you call it that? Because resurrection is as easy for Jesus as saying, wakey, wakey, your teenage son. Which admittedly, is, uh, there, there will be days when it, it seems like you're trying to raise the dead when, when you do that. Um, it's why um, we call cemeteries, cemeteries, I'm not very good at Latin, but apparently the word cemetery, it means dormitory, it means sleeping place. Now, they didn't used to be called that. They weren't called that in other cultures, you know, the Vikings set fire to a boat with their dead on it so that their spirits could sort of dissolve into the atmosphere. Christians lay their dead to sleep, waiting for when they'll wake up again. I love that. I know you don't understand, you know, what do you mean, Jesus? So Jesus explains them to them plainly, verse 14, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. It's the same idea again. It's better that I let him die. Because you need to see what I'm about to do next. I loved them so much, I was willing for him to die so that you could watch what happens. Um, on his arrival, verse 17, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So he wouldn't have made it anyway, even if he'd gone straight away. He, he waited two days longer. But it's like he's extra late and Lazarus is extra dead by this time. Mary, uh, Martha went out to meet Jesus, verse 21. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. What do you think is the tone of that sentence? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. It, it's a kind of statement of faith, isn't it? You, I believe that you could have done something about this, Jesus. You know, I, I think you do have such miraculous power that you could stave off the death of a, of a critically ill man. It's kind of faith. There's kind of disappointment. 
or reproach. Lord, if you'd been here, Jesus, where were you? It's that pain, isn't it, of the, the Christian who trusts that God is powerful, but that almost makes the suffering harder to understand. Lord, you could have stopped this. You're powerful enough to have stopped this. So why didn't you? Where were you, Jesus? Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha, because she's a, an Orthodox Jewish believer, she believes the Old Testament. So she says, yeah, I know. I know, I know he'll rise again at, at the last day. You know, the Old Testament taught that many in the, in the dust of the earth would awake. Some to everlasting life, others to everlasting shame and contempt. She, she believes that. She's read Daniel 12. I know that, Jesus. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even though he they die, will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she says. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's to come into the world. She, she, she's a believer. She believes the Old Testament and what the Scriptures say. She, she believes in Jesus and what he says. But nonetheless, when they get to the graveside and Jesus says, okay, roll away the stone then, she's not so sure. Jesus, really? Like, are you sure? Because it's been four days and we live in the Middle East and it's pretty hot and uh, he's going to start to decompose by now. Um, as the NIV rather politely puts it, by this time there will be an odour as the King James Bible rather more delightfully puts it, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. Um, but, you know, he really will. Those awful stories of um, people who die alone and no one knows that they've died and then you know, the, 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 the postman notices that the, that the mailbox is getting full and eventually someone goes in sort of three months later and they find, I mean, it must be an awful thing, mustn't it, that the police have to do. Jesus... He's decomposing. You really want to open the grave? And it's interesting, isn't it? It's possible to be a believer, a real believer, um, to trust the scriptures, to trust Jesus, but still to be frightened when death comes. Uh, if you've ever seen a dead body, I've, I've seen two in my life. Um, there's been a lot more people than that have died around me, but we have a culture that quickly whisks the dead body out of the way, and the, the medics arrive and take it away so you don't have to see. But if you've ever seen a dead body, I believe, you know, in the Bible, that they'll be raised. It doesn't look like it, though. When a corpse is there in front of you, very cold. Martha, I know that you needed not just the Scriptures to tell you it, but I know that you needed eyewitness evidence of it. That's why I was pleased that I wasn't there. That's why, because I loved you so much, I, I didn't come for two days. Now I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus prays, and he says, Lazarus, come out! And then we have an episode from Scooby-Doo. You know, I mean, if you've seen Scooby-Doo, Hanna-Barbera cartoons from the 1980s, I know some of you are younger than that, but they, they, the plot of Scooby-Doo episode always the same, and it always involves a mummy. So he comes out sort of, you know, with the, the, the grave strips um, tied around his face. Maybe you know this episode. I love this. I love the fact that God never asks us to trust things without evidence. Uh, the idea of blind faith, it's just quite foreign to the, to the New Testament. Now, it's always, faith is always, it just means to trust something. And if you've got any sense, you only trust things for which there's good grounds to believe that they're true. Now, otherwise, you're going to be fleeced on the internet you know, any, any day of the week. Don't trust everyone who calls you and says you've won half a million pounds. Check whether there's reasons to trust them first. And the New Testament knows that. And so God always asks us to trust things on the basis of substantial evidence. Not just that God says that the dead will be raised, but the eyewitnesses in the life of Jesus watch the dead being raised. 
And that's because he just loves us. Uh, he knows that when you're in the hospital uh, and you get the bad news, or you're at the hospital after the bad news and you see your loved one and they're very, very dead, to believe that they're just sleeping? Well, you need evidence to believe that. And Jesus gives evidence. And they see it and they watch him out and Lazarus comes out of the tomb. Maybe you know that story, but I want you to notice what happens immediately next. Therefore, many of the Jews who come to visit Mary and seen what Jesus did believed him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. The chief priests and the Pharisees called an emergency meeting. What are we accomplishing? They said, here is a man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him. I mean, it kind of stands to reason, doesn't it? If Jesus can raise dead people, pretty soon there's going to be more Christians. Because when people find out he can do this, it's pretty obvious that he's God. And I mean, everyone wants to live forever and he can help you too. And, and they think, oh no, this is a disaster. Just think how difficult Jesus is going to be to stop now he started raising dead people. So what's their solution? Let's kill him urgently. Now, it seems odd for us. To, why would you do that? But lo- they have some sort of logic to it. That, that they know that if there's an insurrection... If Jesus rallies a whole messianic movement, if the Jews who are downtrodden by the Romans suddenly have a leader to get behind, then they'll rise up and they think, and then we'll be crushed and there'll be a massacre. You know, the last thing we need at this point in the political turbulence of the first century is a Messiah, a credible Messiah. And Jesus is frankly a credible Messiah. We better kill him. There's a kind of twisted political logic in it. This, this will not play well with the Romans, they think. Um, but actually, Caiaphas, verse 49, one of the chief priests, the chief priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all. You don't realize it's better for you that one man die for the people, that the, the whole nation perish. Now, he's just making a political statement. Better to lose this guy than to lose all of us. But he's kind of speaking better than he knows. And he's making a profound theological statement as well. And John, the author, can't resist pointing that out. He was high priest that year. He was actually prophesying that Jesus would die for the whole Jewish nation. And not only for the Jews, but also for the scattered children of God, which I guess is many of us Gentiles as well, to gather them together and make them one. Therefore, from that day on, they plotted to take his life. You notice the the connection here, that it's because Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead that they plan to kill him. This is the final straw, they think. He's going to be way too popular. We better act now. Then the next thing that happens, we start to get a countdown to the Passover. Six days before the Passover, chapter 12, verse 1, and well, you know that the Passover, that was the time that the, the lamb was sacrificed, commemorating the time that God rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt. And through the death of the lamb, they were redeemed and set free. And so every year, Jewish families would celebrate this, and they're counting down to the death of the lamb that meant life. And in John's Gospel, if you know the, the timeline, it's at Passover that Jesus gets killed. They put it all together. Jesus raises Lazarus. The chief priests have an emergency meeting. And then it's six days before the Passover. Six days before Good Friday. We're on the final countdown. Jesus is about to be killed. He's about to be killed because he raised Lazarus from the dead. And then notice how when we're in chapter 12, we think chapter 11 is the resurrection chapter. Chapter 12 is the sort of ominous murder plot chapter. But all the way through chapter 12, John keeps reminding us of chapter 11. So uh, verse 1, chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Like, yeah, we remember, John. Yeah, because that was just like the last chapter. And I know our memories aren't that good, but we can remember that much. So uh, they have this dinner party, and this woman um, spends her half a litre of pure nard. 
um, on him, anointing him for his burial, he says, verse 7. Verse 9, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. Yeah, John, we, we really, really remember now, because you kind of told us twice, so thanks, but yeah, we got, we got Lazarus. Um, verse 17, the crowd that was with him when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead. John, enough, okay? We get it. Lazarus was raised, and now it's gone south, and they're trying to kill Jesus. We, we get it. But you see how John is connecting together the raising of Lazarus as the trigger that causes, that brings about the plot to kill Jesus. I want us to think about that for a moment as we answer what I think is the other very strange question about the raising of Lazarus. One of them was, why would Jesus, because he loved them, not go and help? And we've, we've answered that because Jesus loved them so much, he wanted them to witness a resurrection that they would know this isn't just wishful thinking, but is really grounded in evidence. We, we've solved that puzzle. Here's the other puzzle. Why is Jesus so upset about the, raise, about the death of Lazarus? Um, verse, this is chapter 11, verse 33. Just look down. Mary said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She repeats the same words of her sister, that sort of reproachful, where were you, Jesus? And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who'd come along with her also weeping, and he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, they asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Uh, we know the verse from the pub quiz because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. But it's also one of the most poignant verses in the Bible. It's not really just Bible trivia, is it? It's a, a window into the Jesus who's not sort of cold and dispassionate and mathematical. It's not just, oh, yeah, but everything's running according to plan, so he dies, I arrive, I raise him. You believe? Oh, QED. It's not that um, cold. Jesus is more personally invested in Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he loves. Than that. Um, when, when you're at funerals, I don't know about you, the, the most poignant thing for me is seeing the family who love the person who died even more than I do. And that's what normally makes me shake up. Went to one funeral of a much loved friend um, at the beginning of this year and seeing his teenage sons carrying the coffin into church. And then I, I couldn't hold it together. Yeah, for Jesus, it's not just the grief of losing Lazarus, who he loved, but seeing his sisters, who he also loves, and their grief, and Jesus cries. I kind of get that, and, and I love the fact that it, it, Jesus is showing us that to be very sad isn't sort of sub-Christian. Jesus isn't doubting that God can raise the dead. He, he knows that. In fact, he's already told us that. This sickness won't end in death, he said. You know, I, I know what I'm about to do. Knowing that death is going to be okay doesn't mean it's wrong to be sad at it. I find that very reassuring at, at Christian funerals. But it's still a bit odd, I find, because Jesus, he kind of knows he's going to raise Lazarus in, what, 10 minutes' time? Surely that would make you a little bit less sad, wouldn't it? You know, like, you're crying now, but just wait until you see this. I think Jesus would say. You see, I find it just a little bit puzzling. I've always puzzled over this, and I never really got it. And then um, recently I just I got an insight from another Christian writer that I think really helped me. Why is Jesus so sad, so grieved, so troubled? Maybe you recognize those words. Jesus was deeply moved and troubled. They come just in the next chapter, in chapter 12, at Gethsemane. Uh, now it's Thursday. The next day is Friday. It's the execution day, the crucifixion. Jesus is troubled 
because he's about to die. But now put that into chapter 11. Chapter 11, chapter 12, they go together. The, the resurrection of Lazarus, the death of Jesus, they're kind of linked. That's why we're told, even at the beginning of chapter 11, oh, this is the Mary who's going to get him ready to be buried. This is why in chapter 12, we look back to chapter 11. This is the Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. Uh, you connect them, I think, like this. That as Jesus stands at the graveside with easily the power to raise Lazarus from the dead, I mean, he's God, he can do this. He contemplates what it will cost him to do it. But Jesus knows that Lazarus' resurrection will come at the cost of his crucifixion. I mean, it's actually all been all the way through John's Gospel. The, the, the whole Gospel beats with this idea that life comes at the cost of death. I mean, it's everywhere. Um, the Lamb of God, says John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the picture of the, the sacrificial Lamb who dies. And then the world lives. Or John 3.16 you know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to, to die. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He dies, he perishes, and we don't perish. Or well, chapter 6, at the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus says, um, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. It's a gruesome picture. I've got to die in order that they might live. It's, it's all the way through the gospel, and Jesus knows the theology. And now here he is at Lazarus' graveside, and he thinks, well, I want to raise you from the dead, but it will cost me. I love this. Resurrection is not just a matter of power for Jesus. It's a matter of sacrifice. Uh, the, the amazing good that Jesus can do for this world to bring life, well, it means he has to go to the cross to bring it. We were thinking at the beginning of this talk what it means to be male. And I don't think we know whether Jesus enjoyed DIY. There's a lot of talk about him being a carpenter's son, but we don't know whether he was any good with a, with a lathe. But we don't know whether Jesus ate cooked breakfast. If he did, he wouldn't have had the bacon or the sausages. Uh, did Jesus like sport? I don't know. The, the, the blokiness about Jesus, the, the, the sketchy details, really. But on this most biblical of male characteristics, courage and sacrifice, he scores pretty highly, doesn't he? Going into danger willingly with his eyes open. Going to his death willingly in order to bring life to others. Now, this talk is partly here to make us love Jesus more. Jesus, the courageous sacrificial, powerful man. Uh, it is to give us more hope. I don't know if on here, I guess there'll be, in the room this size, there'll be people with bad medical news, or people who love people with bad medical news, or maybe people who've re recently been bereaved. And you'll need to know that the courageous, powerful, sacrificial Jesus, not just in theory, but in history and before witnesses, Raise the dead. But also, John encourages us not just to marvel at Jesus and to praise God for Jesus, but also to copy Jesus. There's one little paragraph from chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That same idea, life through death. And then Jesus broadens it. He's done it, but he asks us to do it. Verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, this is a call for courage and for sacrifice. It's one of the reasons we've been so impressed with Zelensky, isn't it? I mean, what a leader. Uh, not like the um, Afghanistan leader who's sort of got on a plane full of money and then disappeared. 
like the Ukraine leader who stayed on the front line. And, I mean, he's the number one target, isn't he? He's the person that they would most like to kill in the whole country. Um, and he continues to serve. That, that's brave, I think, that the Ukrainians go to war. That, that's courage and, and sacrifice. Uh, uh, this summer, we did a little missionary biography series at church, and I got to do um, John Payton, Patton, uh, the, well, he's sometimes known as the missionary to the cannibals, um, because, well, basically, that's what he was. He went to the, um, the New Hebrides, and I'll just read you the timeline, and you'll get a sense of what kind of guy this, this chap was. 1825, John, John Patton born. 1839... John Williams and James Harris martyred on Eramanga. So two American missionaries turn up in the New Hebrides and within a space of weeks are killed almost, um, as soon as they arrive. Uh, so in 1842, more missionaries arrive on Tanner, but they're driven away. It's not safe for them to stay. Uh, then in 1858, John takes his new wife. They got married the previous year. She's pregnant. And they set off for the New Hebrides. So the past history have been Missionaries murdered, missionaries drifting off the island. He gets married. Off we go, darling, <laughs> to the New Hebrides. The next year, Mary and their son die. He stays for three years before he himself is driven off the island. Two years later, he marries Margaret. And this time, he gives her a whole year to settle into married life before. Come on, darling. And they go back to the New Hebrides. 1973, shipwreck, bereavement, sickness. 1879, virtually every person on the New Hebrides has become a Christian. And the latest statistics from, um, I think, uh, 2018, is that 40% of residents of the New Hebrides are evangelical Christians, even today. Kind of courageous, isn't it? Uh, not courageous and naive, though, especially not after you've lost one wife and one son. No, courageous with your eyes open. It's courageous and sacrificial. It's kind of quite masculine in the true sense of the word. But it's kind of very Christian. Very like Jesus at Lazarus' graveside. Not that he's stoic because he's weeping, but that he is brave. And he goes ahead with it, and he calls out, Lazarus, come out. And he knows that he sets in motion the, the chain of events that just a week or so later will have him nailed to a cross to pay for the life that he brings to others. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how we praise you for the Lord Jesus, our courageous, sacrificial king. We praise you for what he does for us uniquely that none of us could do in giving his life to bring us eternal life. But also, Lord, we're deeply challenged by what he does for us as an example that all of us are called to copy, to be men who, for the sake of bringing life and blessing to others, are willing to face mortal danger, to lay down our life, love with courage. Pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen.